our uh, research. Yes. Oh, thank you. We are recording the session. And it's a pleasure to, to be here with you guys. I, I know that it's uh, late for some of us, but uh, the sports in psychosis has this challenge to uh, keep together uh, researchers from all around the globe uh, to collect in an harmonized protocol, uh, specialization protocol. Uh, to understand in common basis um, the phenomenology that we can understand through language or uh, related to formal thought disorders and other aspects of behavior related to psychosis. And we have now uh, 179 members in our network. And uh, we are collecting data in this harmonized protocol uh, in at least 11 countries. So uh, if you wanted to join us, uh, just feel free uh, to attend, uh, to apply in the website and then just uh, needs to ask for us the, the protocol and we'll, we'll help you and add with your grant applications or uh, with your research questions that you wanted to, to apply for this protocol. So in the steering committee, we have Emery Bora, Eric Tan, uh, Gina Kupenberg, Ari Summer, Lena Palaniapan, uh, Maria Francisca Alonso, uh, Natalia Mota, myself, and Wolfram Hinze uh, from different uh, countries and uh, different uh, cultural backgrounds. This is a representation of the main purpose of this network. And we have planned the seminar series um, for um, all those topics. We already had uh, the second and the third uh, uh, meetings. And now we are in the fourth meeting uh, talking about acoustics. And we will we will receive Alberto Parola and Visa Perisha. The format is uh, going to be this five to ten minutes introduction. It's really brief. I like to talk, but I won't bother anymore. <laughs> and the first talk will be around twenty minutes. Follow it by the second talk in this uh, twenty minutes or also. But don't don't be afraid if you plan it to to be a little bit longer. There is no problem because we uh, plan it one hour open discussion for everybody. So if we need um, to to keep this talking, we'll have a lot of uh, time to to talk afterwards. So uh, after both talks, uh, both speakers will uh, have some short comments in each other's talks just to foster the discussion and then one hour uh, of open discussion with the audience. So today I, I have a pleasure to uh, introduce to everyone uh, Dr. Visa Berisha. He is associate professor at the Arizona State University with joint appointment in the College Engineering and College of Health Solutions. His main research interest includes statistical signal processing, machine learning, and information theory with applications to healthcare. His research is primarily funded by the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, and the National Science Foundation. And this work has led to many academic publications, several patents, and venture-backed company. Berisha's work has been featured in New York Times, ESPN, National Public Radio, The Wall Street Journal, and a number of other international media outlets. So it's a pleasure to have you here with us, Visa. And then Dr. Oh, sorry, uh, this is wrong. It's I, I just didn't change the name, sorry. Dr. Alberto Parola. He received his PhD in neuroscience and cognitive science of, from the University of Turin, Ita Italy in 2018. And he's currently postdoctoral fellow in Artus University, Denmark. 
He's currently uh, working on a uh, Europe-funded Mahi Kuhi project, investigating voice and language atypicalities as markers of schizophrenia and its symptoms. In his research, he adopts a meta-scientific and cumulative approach to explore how voice and natural language processing finds in uh, schizophrenia generalize across different languages, settings, and contexts, and to identify limitations and promising venues uh, of the scientific fields. And his main uh, research interest lies on pragmatics of communication, speech, natural language processing analysis, with particular focus on applications of computational and machine learning methods to study these topics. So it's going to be a pleasure to listen to, to this multi uh, 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 approaches that uh, Parola uh, opens to us. And uh, now I will stop the share and ask for Alberto to start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, for the uh, introduction. Now I'm sorry, let's try to share my screen. Okay. Mm, let me try again in just a moment. It's not working. <laughs> okay. We did it like five minutes ago and it was working perfectly. And now, <laughs> anyway. Can you see the share button, Alberto? Yeah, yeah, I can. But I, when I um, put the slide at the full screen, it disappeared the sharing and I can move in it. Don't know why, because it was working, but I will, you fix, I will fix this. Yes. Um, Don't know why. You know, do you want to switch orders? Is that better if Visa starts? I don't know if that helps. Uh, I'm I'm happy to if it simplifies things, whatever, whatever you prefer. Natalia, okay, now it seems just a moment. Really weird. I don't know what is. <laughs> I can really see the <laughs> sharing option and I can share. Okay, let me try now. Okay. No, it doesn't work. If can can you can we do like this, Alberto? Maybe uh, just can... a moment, just a moment. No, maybe okay. maybe it was this. It was sorry, bye. <clears throat> Whoever is the host should presumably make Alberto the host if they haven't. Yeah, he, he's no, already. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the host. I'm the host. It's not that the problem. The problem is that I'm not visualizing the. Okay. Maybe Thanks, now. Mark. Okay. Well, it's not easy it's to do this. Working. Sorry, but <laughs> no problem. If if you need an extra time, uh, just feel free to. We can. Oh. 
Can you see now the screen? Yes. Oh yeah. Great. Excellent. Sure, it was because the, um, the zoom was reduced to an icon on the top right. And so I have to open it to screen now. It worked. Okay. Sorry for being late. Now I can stop. Okay, acoustic marker of schizophrenia, assessing cross-linguistic generalizability of machine learning models. So I will talk about acoustic and voice analysis in schizophrenia, in particular, um, a new recent project, project in which we assess the cross-linguistic generalizability of uh, machine learning models uh, uh, relying on voice acoustic features. So, can you see that? Okay. Okay, why speech and voice uh, are relevant for mental health? Uh, for reason is speed is because speech is a highly sensitive signal. So even uh, little small changes in the speaker's emotional, physical, or mental states can affect the uh, vocal apparatus and consequently the speech production. And so um, a pathological condition may affect the mechanism controlling the vocal production. For example, in Parkinson's disease, we can observe that the motor disorder associated with Parkinson um, impact on voice uh, muscles and so can be reflected in a very characteristic vocal patterns that can also inform us on the underlying features of the condition. And this is true also for other disorders and conditions like developmental disorder, affective disorder, psychosis, uh, neurological condition. Um, and for this reason, and also for these other reasons, speech and voice analysis is an ideal candidate for developing digital phenotyping of uh, psychiatric disorder because voice analysis can also be automated, is potentially scalable to large corpora, for example, doesn't need transcript, is cost effective, is objective quantitative, potentially unobtrusive, and also can be um, recorded in real time naturalistic setting via mobile device. So the voice analysis can be potentially used to monitor the development of the disorder, to scaffold the diagnostic process, for example, to test the effectiveness of a treatment, and even more important, to gain um, a perspective on the so underlying social and cognitive dimension associated with this uh, condition. Um, here's an overview of our recent uh, uh, work and also the talk um, um, the work that we did in the last year, so on voice analysis in schizophrenia. So in 2018, we started with a meta-analysis of voice pattern literature in schizophrenia, in which we identified the limitation and the future perspective of the field. And then relying on this work, we developed a Marie Curie application, a project called Modeling Model Expression in Schizophrenia, aimed at promoting a multi-language data collection. And then we uh, also relying on the indication, the reflection we made in the meta-analysis develop uh, what we call the cumulative approach to test the generalizability of voice and NLP results in schizophrenia, relying on a large cross-linguistic corpus that we, we built. Uh, and this gave rise to two publications. One is publishing on schizophrenia research, the other is still preprint. And more recently, we moved to deploying a machine learning pipeline to test the generalizability of uh, machine learning models of voice features in schizophrenia. And I will focus more on this last two work today. And then at the end, I will uh, discuss the future perspective. Uh, so the new data collection, the, the collaboration with the, the school consortium. So vocal markers of schizophrenia, is this a new idea? And the answer is no. Uh, these papers are from the 60s. And this is an histogram representing the number of public publication on voice analysis in schizophrenia. And as you can see, there is uh, there was a kind um, of several rays of publication in the last uh, ten years. But the first wave of publication is uh, situated in the seventies uh, and in the eighties. So this is just to say that um, this research field has a long tradition, started a long time ago. It's not something new. Um, and we found out this uh, result when we did the, our meta-analysis in 2018. The aim of the meta-analysis was first to provide uh, um, an overview of the literature, but even more important, uh, our main, main aim was to provide the basis for more effective future study. So we wanted to identify the current practices, the issues, and in particular the promising venues. For example, we investigated the attitudes toward data sharing, finding that. The, the data sharing in this field was almost non-existent. 
And the results of this meta-analysis was that we found a very characteristic pattern associated with schizophrenia, characterized by reduced speech production. So patients with schizophrenia tend to speak less, tend to be um, less fluent, so reduced speech rate, and tend also to have increased pause duration. So they produce longer pauses. And also they show reduced speech variability, so a less variable tone of voice uh, um, and reduced emphasis. And these features were also associated with symptoms, in particular allogenic platelet. But the main important result of the meta-analysis was uh, counterintuitively the limitations because we found uh, uh, publication bias, large heterogeneity. It was uh, very difficult to collate together findings and studies with different methodology, with different features extracted, um, with different um, using different speech tasks and with different clinical sample. We also found a total lack of theory-driven hypothesis, no, so no reflection on the mechanism responsible for this voice atypicality, and also no analysis, for example, of voice quality features. But the two most important problems that we found uh, reviewing the literature were the cross-linguistic generalizability of results, because we know the speech maps into language, so that different languages may have, have different phonological, syntactical, and prosodic structures. Um, and so these can uh, affect the voice pattern, and we found different voice patterns and voice features across different languages. Mm, but this is an understudied topic. There, we, we didn't find a, a single study investigating this uh, cross-linguistic generalizability in our meta-analysis, but we found some pointers in the literature uh, that indicated as uh, the voice patterns can be really mm, influenced by the specific uh, linguistic structure. For example, the study of Cocal in 2017 found that not poses in general, but just a specific kind of poses, that is uh, unfilled poses uh, in the utterance initial position, um, distinguished between patient with schizophrenia and control. And there are also, for example, some recent studies that found as um, differences, um, linguistic differences in Danish and Norwegian speaking might give rise to systematic changes also in developmental trajectory or uh, conversational pattern. So, um, of course, linguistic generalizability is uh, something that has not been tested in schizophrenia, has been assumed, but not tested is an important issue. The other issue is the heterogeneity. So we know that schizophrenia is a very heterogeneous disorder in terms of uh, social demographic and clinical feature. Um, also, for example, for pharmacotherapy. So it's mm, generally assumed that schizophrenia is a homogeneous group, but we often can observe uh, different subgroups, subsample, different cluster of patients, and this makes it very difficult to compare uh, the results of the different study that included very different subpopulation. Uh, and also speech patterns are really highly heterogeneous, uh, and this can lead to the presence of uh, potential bias and also make it difficult to establish which are the true differences between patients and control. So we have multiple layers of complexity and of heterogeneity that interact and interacting one with each other. And this is an uh, important problem we found in the literature. So we try to overcome some of these uh, limits. We develop what we call the uh, scientific cumulative approach. So we relied on the reflection made in the meta-analysis and we to design a new research and we build a large cross-linguistic corpus made of four languages, um, Danish, German, Chinese, and Japanese, a corpus of uh, speech recordings of patients with schizophrenia and uh, controls. And then we use this corpus to test whether the results of the meta-analysis replicate and generalize across the different samples and languages of our corpus. And also, we try to account explicitly for the heterogeneity, uh, in particular in the demographical, clinical, and pharmacological features. So this is the sample. Our sample included 231 participants with schizophrenia and 238 matched controls in four languages for more than 4,000 recordings. We collected those clinical data, and we used the as speech task, the animated triangle task, uh, is a descriptive task. Uh, um, because in the task is required to participant to describe the animation which appears on a left on screen and that represent two animated triangles. So they have to describe and this description is record, audio recording. We extract the acoustic features, the one described in the meta-analysis, 
and then we compare the, <clears throat> the um, acoustic pattern uh, between patients and controls. And what we found is that on the left, you can see the result from the pitch variability. And you can see what you, you see on the graph is the FX size. So in the case of pitch variability, we found lower pitch variability in patients compared to controls so negative FX size and negative difference. And this is the only result that replicated consistently across the four, all the four languages. While for the other acoustic features, we found only limited replication. So for example, speech percentage, uh, we found the increased speech percentage in Chinese and Japanese corpus, and this is uh, um, in contrast with the result on the meta-analysis, for example, where we found reduced speech percentage. We didn't, we didn't find any difference in Danish and German. Uh, and for speech rate, we found reduced speech, speech rate in line with the meta-analysis, but only in the Danish corpus. And for post duration, we found increased post duration, but only in the Danish and German corpus, no difference in the other languages. So this is a summary table. As, as you can see, the only acoustic features that was uh, consistently replicated across languages was pitch variability. While for the other features, in particular the duration features, we found only limited replication or no replication at all, as in the case of speech percentage. And so the results of this uh, study, the main results were that we found a minimal cross-linguistic robust acoustic profile that that is reduced the pitch variability associated with the, potentially with negative symptoms, while duration features were not consistently replicated in uh, our study with important cross linguistic differences. And the same for the symptoms, we found some association, but very a lot of inconsistency when we move between different rating scale and between across different languages. So the main point of um, this, so the overview of this, uh, the results of this first study were that the, we found a very important discrepancy with the results of the meta-analysis and we found a very important role of linguistic and cultural differences. So a typical voice pattern were, for example, more similar with the Germanic and non-Germanic language families. We found also large heterogeneity. So we found that uh, in sociodemographic factors, also clinical factors, in particular pharmacotherapy, affected the voice pattern and so should be taken into the account because they can really impact on the analysis uh, on the results. And we applied the same approach uh, on natural language processing, in particular on measures of semantic coherence, because we know that uh, also NLP has been proposed as a candidate for developing digital phenotyping of schizophrenia, and in particular, several studies found that reduced the NLP-based measures of semantic coherence. So that is the semantic similarity between words and schizophrenia. So the a reduced coherence as a reduced semantic similarity. And these measures have been argued to be able to classify patients and controls, and also to predict psychosis onset with very high accuracy. But again, uh, looking at the overall literature, we found uh, that uh, uh, there were no cross-linguistic comparison or very few cross-linguistic comparison, uh, few replication and very different um, uh, data analysis pipeline, very different uh, uh, operationalization of coherence measures. So it was very difficult to compare results. And so we tried to apply the same approach uh, that I described for, for voice analysis for these uh, NLP-based uh, measures of coherence using our corpus. So we used our corpus, the transcript, we derived these measures of coherence, and we tested the generalizability of previous results across different languages, uh, across heterogeneous samples, and also across different measures of coherence. And what we found again is that is a reduced replicability of results. So for example, we replicated the reduced coherence for these two measures, similarity mean and coherence K5, but only in the Chinese corpus, no difference in Danish and German corpus. Same for uh, these other measures on the left, coherence five. And the only coherence measures that replicated across all the corpus, uh, Danish, German, and Chinese, was this second order coherence, the central level measure of coherence. So this is just to say that we found very similar uh, result to those that we found with voice analysis. So a very limited cross-linguistic generalizability. Um, and this is the state of the art of the voice acoustic and also NLP literature. But 
we try to move further and ask ourselves uh, some questions, uh, some more questions. Uh, so, for example, an important point is um, uh, that voice patterns are inherently multidimensional. There are multiple acoustic features interacting with each other, often in nonlinear ways. There are also non-standard features, for example, voice quality features uh, um, that have been generally neglected in previous literature, but they have been shown to be crucial, for example, in detection of uh, symptoms of other disorder like uh, Parkinson or depression. So maybe this is one this is one of the reasons for the low um, limited generalizability of previous results. And so we could ask. Uh, what happens if we build machine learning models able to include and count this larger set of acoustic features and also their um, complex interaction patterns? And so we reviewed the, <clears throat> the previous literature. In particular, we updated the meta analysis results and we found nine studies that employed that used the machine learning uh, technique to investigate voice patterns in schizophrenia, four before 2018 and fifth after 2018. And we found uh, large differences across these studies in terms of the sample size. For example, sample size varied from 31 participants to 284 participants. And also, for example, some um, sample were so that the patients and controls were matched on uh, several variables, other were not, or some sample were balanced, uh, mean, balancing between patients and control, other were not. Uh, we found differences in the acoustic feature extracted. Some feature set included 10 features, other, for example, included 300 features. And we found important differences in the machine learning pipeline used. Uh, for example, in the uh, classifier employed, in the, uh, the splitting uh, and in the cross validation, some studies used cross validation, other not. So it was very difficult to compare these studies. And the accuracy of the studies in identifying patients with schizophrenia ranged from 70% to 92%, with, I could say, a mean accuracy around 80%. So this is a, um, a sparse and fragmented literature. It was very difficult to compare results across studies for um, the reason I mentioned before. It was also difficult to identify the features relevant for the classifications was difficult to um, assess the impact of heterogeneity, for example, the impact of gender on classification. Um, and there, the most important thing is that what it seems to be missing was an explicit and systematic way, for example, a pipeline to test the generalization of these machine learning models across languages, across conditions, for example, speech tasks and across contexts. But this is a very um, crucial aspect if our endpoint is clinical applicability of voice uh, markers, uh, because uh, a voice marker should be really robust uh, across condition, languages, or contexts, or at least we should be aware of the limit of the limitation and all of the limited generalizability. So the very aim of this, um, of our last project was to investigate the generalizability of machine learning models of vocal markers of schizophrenia. And to this aim, we screened the literature that I presented before. And then we develop a highly conservative pipeline that is a pipeline um, focused on being more robust and aimed at reduced overfitting. And, and use this pipeline to test the replicability of previous machine learning results across the languages of the corpora that I've described before. So we write on this new uh, cross linguistic data set. Um, that is the same I described before. So with 231 patients with schizophrenia, 238 um, controls in four languages. And we asked four questions. So, so the first question was, uh, if we train a model in a specific language, for example, if we train a model on Danish data and we test the model on new participants speaking the same language, what is the performance of the classifier? And the second question is, if we train a model in a specific language, for example, Danish, and then we test the model to participants speaking a different language, for example, speaking German or Chinese, um, is there a drop of performance or the performance is still uh, good? And so and the second question is the generalizability across language of the model. And then the question three, I will respond to, I will try to respond to tackle question one and two with, 
some results and while the question three and four uh, are um, still a work in progress, so I will uh, discuss them in future at, at the end in the future perspective. And the question three and four are what happens if we try to combine models training on different languages? Um, could this help to improve the generalization performance? Or question four, what if we train more machine learning models on a multi-language training set? So if, if we put together in a training set participants speaking different languages, and then we test this model on a, a third different language, for example. And so this is the sample that I described before um, with the speech task is uh, the, always the animated triangle task. And this is the machine learning pipeline. So we, we did first data pre-processing, uh, data cleaning, we removed the, uh, the background noise and we removed the intervention of the, um, uh, the clinicians. So we, we left only the uh, speech of the patients and the controls. Then we extracted two feature sets, the cover app and EG maps feature set, but I will focus for now only on the cover app uh, feature set. And then we did the data preparation. Um, so we um, did a training test set split with an 80-20 split, so 80% data assigned to the training set and 20 to the test set. And then the training set was uh, divided in five folds to perform a five folds cross-validation. Then we did data normalization, so min-max normalization, and feature selection using elastic net regularization within the five folds cross-validation procedure. And then we did the model training and testing. Um, so this maybe it's clear from the slide. So for example, the Danish training set was divided in five uh, folds and we trained the model on the first four folds and then we tested the model on the fifth fold. And then again, this process was iterated five times. So we again, a change at the validation set, we test on the other four folds and another fold was used as a validation set. At, at the end of this uh, cross-validation process, we um, have five models for each language. And these five models were used to assess uh, uh, the performance on the test set. And so their prediction were combined into a single ensemble prediction. Uh, for example, each model made a prediction for each recording in the test set, that is schizophrenia or control. And then the final sample prediction was based on the majority. So if five, four models predict schizophrenia and one control, the final prediction was schizophrenia. And so we used the, um, these uh, models uh, trained for uh, each language to test and uh, to tackle the two questions. So we tested on the test set of the same language to assess the performance um, when testing on participants speaking the same language. And we tested this the black arrow on participants speaking a different language to test the cross-linguistic generalizability. And these are the results. We found that the, we used, I have to make some, um, to add some details. We, first of all, we <clears throat> stratified the test and training set by participant ID. So there, all the recordings of each participant stayed in one, in the same fold and the same for the test set. Uh, we also balanced the uh, test set by a diagnosis uh, and uh, by biological se sex. Uh, um, and also we use it as a classifier, a support vector machine. And another, um, another detail, the test set contained never seen before participants so to avoid any kind of data leakage. And these are the results. Uh, we found that when the model were trained and tested on the same language, the performance in terms of uh, F1, but the results for the accuracy were very similar. So you could take this as a result, as a, um, the accuracy. Uh, we found that the performance, um, the, the accuracy were between 70 and 80%. So in line with the results of the previous studies. But when we move it to test the cross-linguistic generalizability, you can see that when the model, for example, was trained on Danish and tested on German and Chinese, the performance dropped to 50% to chance level even lower. And the same for when the model was trained on German and tested on Danish and Chinese, again, the performance was close to chance even lower. And for China, when the model was trained on Chinese data and tested on Danish and German uh, participants, uh, we got accuracy around 55%, so a bit better, but 
still close to chance level. So the we, we observed a very drop, a very fall of uh, um, classification accuracy when we move across languages. And this is the result for the validation set. So again, in the validation set, the performance were around 70, 75%, so close to the results of the previous literature. Uh, you can see that there are two um, results in each cell because we um, uh, use a different hyperparameter. So in, uh, on, uh, on the left, we use the uh, default hyperparameters. On the right, we use instead um, the hyperparameter tuning with this cross validation procedure. And so this is the, an overview of the results. We found that the accuracy in the test sets are in line with previous literature, but generally slightly lower, uh, and in any case, well above chance, while, and this is more or less the same for the validation set. Um, and also we found, for example, that sample size can play a role because that each set a uh, higher performance. While for the question two, so, so the cross-linguistic generalizability, we found that the performance across languages was generally low, 50, 60% at the best, with the performance generally very close to chance level and sometimes even below. So very limited generalizability of machine learning models when uh, they try to predict participants speaking a different language. A reason, possible reasons, uh, um, there are important cross-linguistic differences uh, and thus uh, the features relevant for classification task in one language can vary substantially when we move to a different language. And also overfitting, we use a very conservative pipeline that helps to reduce overfitting. Um, and we suggest that it very, it's very important to test the robustness and generalizability of these models across conditions, uh, um, not only languages. So we found generally uh, performance a bit lower than in previous literature, even when testing uh, the model on the same language. Limitation, we had small samples, uh, even the sample was larger compared to previous literature. It still uh, mm, can be still considered a small, a relatively small sample, especially if we consider the heterogeneity associated with the schizophrenia spectrum. We had some differences, uh, even if limited across our corpora in terms of clinical and social demographic characteristics. So this can uh, have an impact of the, on the generalization performance. Um, and we have um, also limited interpretability because uh, the features selected uh, generally were um, corresponding to a large set. So this made it uh, difficult to identify the feature most important in the classification. And then we have work, this is a work in progress. So we should still have to do our analysis. Uh, we should still assess the other feature set, the EGMAP sets. We have still to, for example, using different uh, classifier, assess uh, the differences um, between these different classifiers. But we have also future perspectives. So um, are there some solutions that can be applied to trying to overcome this uh, limitation and this problem? Uh, yes, one is trust from learning. So for example, it's very important to um, identify um, possible tasks. In this study, we we're not able to vary the task, but the speech task could be an important aspect um, and could be really important to identify which task allow a better uh, transfer learning and better generalization. For example, it could be emotional speech. Or we should also, we can also focus on underlying psychopathological dimension. Uh, so should focus on identifying clinically relevant speech feature associated with specific uh, subgroup or with specific clinical um, symptoms, symptomatological and clinical characteristics. Uh, and then we need larger and richer data set um, and open data set because this data set can be used as a benchmark for test the robustness of different pipeline, uh, for example, of using different acoustic feature sets, uh, different hyperparameter setting or preprocessing options this is really important. We don't have at the present this kind of benchmark. Uh, and even more important can be used to test uh, the role of potential bias. And then uh, last point, uh, we could try to use multi-language models. So we could try to um, combine prediction from different language models. So for example, if you look at this slide, we could 
imagine to have uh, two models trained on two different languages, for example, Danish, one model trained on Danish and one train on, trained on German. And then we can try to combine the prediction of these two models um, in what is called a mixture of expert that use the prediction of the information from both models to predict uh, the participants speaking a third language, for example, Chinese. And this is particularly um, a good solution because the models can be trained separately. So we don't need to, to put together the data of the two data sets. And another solution is instead to try to put together, um, to combine um, the data of uh, two languages. For example, we can imagine to put together the Danish and German data and create a, a multi-language training set, train a model on that uh, training set, and then try to test this multi-language model uh, on a third set, for example, on the Chinese test set, and assess whether this improved uh, performance of the model. So there are some solutions um, and my, I will conclude uh, uh, repeating that one of the most important things is really to have a uh, uh, larger and richer data set and to have uh, um, better data to test all of these uh, 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 different methodological choices that you can make when you do machine learning models. So thank you very much. Um, also to the, the my reaction that's supporting me, and this is a, these are the uh, publication and preprint if you are interested in our work. And thanks also to my collaborators. Thanks a lot, Alberto. <laughs> it was a really nice presentation, and I think it it's it talks to to the the main thing that we have here, and the discourse on psychosis. So, um, Mark, do you have a question? If you wanted to talk? Uh, I have a, a comment. Of course, the first thing I want to say is this is fantastic work. It's very mm -hmm. important. It's a real step forward. Um, and what I'm about to say is not a criticism of the content of that presentation, but rather a discussion of something sort of oddly left out. So, uh, you discussed you're in your own in the work that you've collected, everyone is doing the same task, um, although they're doing it in different places, different rooms, uh, under the guidance of different uh, um, interviewers or uh, mm. clinical researchers. And we know that, never mind in clinical applications, but with ordinary with everybody, there are really important effects of style, topic, interlocutor, physical and social context, et cetera. Uh, talking with a friend is very, very different from talking with a stranger. Talking with a stranger who seems especially friendly and sympathetic is very different from talking with a stranger who seems somewhat distant and cold or somewhat more formal. Um, I mean, we there are many studies of that kind of thing. Uh, talking in a reverberant room versus an anechoic room is different. Talking with someone right next to you versus talking with someone at the other side of a fairly large table is different. Um, there's an effect of background noise and the so-called Lombard effect. Um, sociolinguists, when they do interviews in order to try to get people to speak more naturally and less formally, um, they try to get people to tell them well-rehearsed narratives, so-called danger of death stories. They figure that's something that people, a story that people will have told many times. And so they'll be familiar with it and they'll kind of lose their sense of talking with a stranger and start getting into a more normal, uh, a more informal mode of speech. It doesn't always work though. Um, if you compare uh, someone telling a familiar story versus telling a less familiar one um, or dealing with a, a request to talk about something which for some reason, for whatever reason, is harder or more troubling or more difficult um, for everybody, that those things are going to make a difference. And uh, so what you did was great in having everybody do the same task, you know, describe the triangle animation. Um, obviously, if you had if you were looking at semi-structured interviews with different interviewers, then they would have to be allowing somehow for who the interviewer is. Um, but still, I wonder if you could say something about all these other 
dimensions that cause variation in how people talk. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree. <laughs> in the sense that these are the difficulties that we uh, are facing every time we start a data collection. So, for example, when you um, have to administer a conversational task, uh, you immediately notice that it's almost impossible to standardize a conversational task because the consequence is that you are mm, you are not having any more a conversational task. So, um, there are very very important differences in all the collision that you mentioned and so um, i think that the aim of our study was more narrow it was just to say that um this cross linguistic generalizability has been assumed but should not be assumed because if we have important differences within a language within a sample of participants with similar cultural background or linguistic background this could be even larger even administering the same task with a standardized procedure because our task is pretty standardized and so um, this is not ensure that the administrator was really e e the, the same across all the uh, uh, all different sites but I mean uh, ensures the most possible um, uh, homogeneity across the different sites so even with this uh, uh, standardized procedure we found very important differences this is just to say that it's something that Future studies should pay more attention on this. Uh, did, did you look at test retest replicability for the same subject? Um, you mean the uh, intersubject? Um, Have the same subject come back a week later and do the same task, kind of thing. We we use we model it, so we use the different description. We have ten uh, trials for each participant, and we model. We use this as a random. Uh, I mean say varying uh, effects across participants uh i didn't we didn't look specifically at how higher was the um, i mean inter trial consistency but this is something that uh, i am um, in my mind from a lot of time i should uh, go back to the data but anyways yes we modeled the so we included the repeated measurement in the analysis this was the question Great, thanks, Mark. Um, so I I wanted to invite Visa. Uh, we'll have an uh, extra hour <laughs> to uh, almost an hour to keep the discussion. And uh, the, this is the main main topics here. We are talking about uh, important issues for for the main purpose of dispersing psychosis. So thanks you guys for for. Uh, Foster this discussion. So, Visa, please. Yeah. yeah. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So, this is a very nice segue, this last discussion about heterogeneity of speech. Uh, what I want to talk about today is some of the potential pitfalls of developing speech based clinical tools speech-based clinical machine learning models in particular, and in particular, these multivariate models of the type that Alberto mentioned at the end. Um, the, I became interested in this, in this particular problem back in actually in 2014, we had developed a model for evaluating uh, uh, speech impairment, dysarthria in Parkinson's disease and in ALS. And uh, it worked really well. We followed best practices in the lab and we decided to evaluate to do a small scale prospective evaluation of this machine learning model in clinic so we have the speech and hearing clinic here at asu and there was a massive drop off in performance and, and so the question then became why and i actually became very interested in this problem how is it that you can fool yourself into thinking you built something really really well um, high accuracy estimates but then when you deploy it deploy it out of sample when you deploy it uh, in clinic it performs uh, really poorly and and so that that led to um, actually this paper that we published late last year and and some of the some of the work from this paper I'll talk about today um, if uh, but however if you if you want sort of a more detailed discussion of what can go wrong in uh, AI models in healthcare but specifically in speech-based AI models uh, uh, feel free to to take a look at this 
some collaborators. So a lot of the work that I'll talk about, especially at the end of the presentation, uh, was done by, by uh, I guess now Dr. Rohit Voletti, who's a, our PhD student, but he recently graduated. My collaborator, Julie Liss, and, and Chris, uh, Chris Bowie, who uh, we've been collaborating with for several years now. And then, of course, uh, you know, everyone knows that most of the work is done by the students. We just get to, to present it on their behalf. So a uh, whole host of other students and postdocs. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about the promise of speech-based biomarkers or speech-based digital phenotyping. And <clears throat> today we'll talk about uh, mental health disorders, schizophrenia, and, and, and bipolar disorder. But in general, the same applies for, for other, uh, other conditions as well. The idea is that for many different conditions, uh, the, the changes in speech and language are harbingers of some, some upstream disturbance. So mental health disorder is perhaps their, their premonitory symptoms for an oncoming uh, 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 psychosis episode, psychotic episode. Um, for, for mild cognitive impairment, it could be early signs of, of mild cognitive impairment. They have perhaps before it's clinically uh, uh, clinically detectable, but this is sort of the upstream version of the problem, right? You want to use speech and language production as an early uh, indicator of some something uh, important that's happening upstream. But we also use speech and language to communicate with individuals, right? So if you've already been diagnosed with schizophrenia and you want to evaluate uh, social skills as a functional outcome, then speech and language features are very important in that context. If you see that there's disturbance in speech and language, then that can help predict uh, 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 impaired social skills, which then has downstream uh, consequences, perhaps uh, about the ability to work or spend time with others, maintain interpersonal relationships, and so on. So this is what we call the downstream problem, the use of speech as a way of, of assessing quality of life type parameters, uh, social skills and, 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 and functional capacity, right? So the upstream problem, detecting early signs of something, downstream problem, uh, uh, more related to functional, uh, functional outcomes. So this is the promise of, of speech-based biomarkers. And I think as we saw from, from Alberto's talk and from, from the literature as a whole, the reality of speech-based biomarkers is, is supervised machine learning. Meaning, uh, you take some version of the problem that I discussed in the previous slide, and you convert it into a machine learning problem. Uh, in many cases, this ends up being a classification problem. Perhaps you're interested in building a tool to classify between healthy controls and patients with schizophrenia. So you start with some available corpus, and from it, you extract a, a series of features. Uh, you know, the, the, there's uh, many different publicly available data sets, or I'm sorry, publicly available uh, uh, packages for extracting speech features. The Open Smile package, GE Maps, some of the, the COVA reps, some of the features that, that Alberto mentioned. Um, and then also we do the same with, with the language features, for example, based on the BERT model. And what you get is a high dimensional feature set that is extracted from all samples in your data, the control and the schizophrenic samples in, in uh, my example here. And then you develop a classifier, in this case, to separate between the two. So we want to predict a clinical variable of interest, uh, in this case, class membership or diagnostic class membership, and you get some, some error rate. Now, oftentimes, what ends up happening, and this is especially true in academia, is that uh, we want to improve the error rate. However, acquiring additional samples is costly, but adding additional features to the model is not. And so the uh, graduate student working on this problem will add additional uh, acoustic or linguistic features and, and increase the complexity of the model. And all of a sudden they notice uh, uh, the error rate uh, uh, de decreasing. So of course this feels good, because you see that, at least in your mind, the, the, the performance of the model is improving. So then you further add some additional features. Now you go for the whole spectrum. So rather than, than extracting some features, you use the raw audio and further increase the complexity of the prediction model. And at some point, the error rate asymptotes 
and and you see that you can't drive it any further. And so then uh, what do you do? Well, if the resulting accuracy is good, you publish the final model. Um, if it's not, then you move on to the next project. You stick this in the uh, proverbial file drawer, right? This is uh, uh, what I'm going to claim is that this is actually uh, that this this uh, happens quite a bit in the academic literature, where we have different groups working on the same problem. However, us as consumers of this literature only get to see the final product, right? We don't see the intermediate steps of all of the different things that were tried. Um, okay, so so uh, by the way, it, in, in case there, there's others here that that have sort of engineering backgrounds or, or technical backgrounds, this uh, this has been referred to as as graduate student descent. So when you um, when you optimize a machine learning model, you use gradient descent. <laughs> when you use a graduate student to optimize a model, you, you use graduate student descent, right? Um, the so so what's what what are some of the the pitfalls of this particular approach? Well, we've identified several. The, the first is that the existing speech features aren't repeatable. So we documented this in the first publication here. We looked at some of the commonly used speech and language features for clinical applications, and we did a very simple experiment. We had individuals using their own personal devices provide speech samples on two consecutive days. And, with, and then we looked at the test retest reliability of all of the features um, on from uh, uh, samples collected on, on on consecutive days across a number of uh, what I'll call uh, standardized speech elicitation tasks. These did not involve an interlocutor, so in some sense they're a very simplified version of the problem that that Mark mentioned, which is you know that we we didn't account for the fact that people's speech changes by virtue of who they're speaking with, but rather. Um, just looked at the variability in the features uh, in um, on, on two consecutive days, where there were other nuisance factors. Perhaps one day they, they felt uh, uh, better than than the previous day, or perhaps they they uh, there was less background noise, uh, or, or there was just simple uh, variability in in production. And what we found is that the actual average test retest reliability, if you use the ICC, the um, Inter uh, uh, inter something correlation. I yeah, I, I I forget what the second C stands for. Nevertheless, it was a 0.35, which is which is quite uh, fairly low. The second the second issue, and this you can see from from many studies I've identified one here, is that the features themselves don't necessarily capture clinically relevant parameters. So what do I mean by that? Well, these high dimensional feature sets. They co-vary with other parameters, for example, age, uh, 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 demographics, and so on. And so in this particular paper, they use just the demographic information to detect cognitive impairment. And they see a, a performance of a, an area under the curve of 0.89. When they use uh, speech plus demographics, they see a, a very modest improvement, something like 0.8. Uh, I'm sorry, 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.9 or something like that. So a very small improvement by including both speech and demographics. The, the takeaway there is that the speech features themselves are telling you more about the demographic variables than they are about the actual clinical conditions. And, and that's important because the, the, the hope, at least in this area, is that if you're doing digital phenotyping for the condition that the features themselves are, are in some ways clinically relevant. If if you're just measuring age in a more complicated way, when uh, you, you know it's questionable how helpful that is. And then uh, three is that the, the the features themselves are not clinically interpretable. Uh, a lot of these features have been repurposed from the automatic speech recognition literature, and it's not exactly clear how one uh, reasons about whether changes. Uh, that you see in the clinical conditions make sense relative to what's already known about the disease in the literature, right? And so the claim that we make in publications three and four here is that all of this leads to models that don't generalize. And what I mean by that is all of the, the there's lots of publications that have looked at speech-based 
machine learning models for clinical applications, and they all report accuracies. And the, the claim here is that the accuracies that are reported in the literature are overly optimistic. And if one was to take one of these models and deploy it, prospectively evaluate it, that they wouldn't perform nearly as well as the accuracies that are uh, uh, reported. And, and, and so let's um, go on to the next slide here, and I'll, I'll uh, hopefully show you that with, with data. So this is uh, this particular graph has two axes. The x-axis is the total sample size, and the y-axis is the reported accuracy. We went through and combined uh, across three different meta-analyses, looking at papers that try to distinguish between healthy controls in patients with Alzheimer's disease or healthy controls and uh, uh, patients with other forms of cognitive impairment. So this combination across three meta-analysis meta resulted in 77 different papers that had trained a classifier based on speech and language in order to predict group status. And again, two types of analyses, healthy controls versus Alzheimer's disease and healthy controls versus other forms of cognitive impairment. Now, across all of these papers, there were sort of two constants, right? Like two things that you could you could uh, use to combine across all of these papers. One was the, the the total sample size available to the developers to develop the model, and the second is the accuracy that they reported. So, out of the seventy-seven papers, there were fifty, uh, I believe, fifty-five that had uh, reports of sample size and accuracy. So what we did is we simply plotted them on this two-dimensional graph here. And what you see is that in terms of what's reported in the literature, there's a 4% decrease in the reported accuracy per unit increase in the log of the sample size, meaning the larger the sample size uh, used to develop the model, the lower the reported accuracy, or said another way, the smaller the sample size, the higher the accuracy. Now, this is really unusual, right? Like if, if you have a properly trained machine learning model, what you would expect is that as the sample size increases, the accuracy also increases. Uh, here we see exactly the opposite trend. And, and, um, and, and so when, when I make the claim that, that the uh, accuracy results that are that are uh, reported in the academic literature are overly optimistic. It's it's uh, largely on the back of 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 this particular observation. The um, I'll I'll try to or at least I'll I'll I'll, I'll hypothesize about why uh, why we think this is happening. But but this this was sort of the the main result from the paper here. Uh, I'll present this at Interspeech twenty two. Uh, but if you're interested, I'm happy to share a preprint. Uh, just feel free to send me an email. Okay. Okay. So why why does why does this happen? Um, well, to to try and and at least provide some intuition for why we think this happens, uh, let's juxtapose the way the scientific method works with the way ML based science works. So, if you wanted to design a quasi experiment using the scientific method, then uh, you might start by having some inclusion criteria and a definition for what the control group and what the clinical group is. And so in this case, you would go and recruit participants and enroll them in the study um, according to this inclusion criteria. And let's say you were interested in evaluating whether, um, oh, um, say there are uh, neurocognitive differences between healthy controls and patients with schizophrenia. Well, what you would do is you would measure the relevant dependent variables. In my example, you would measure neurocognition. And of course, there's lots of uh, uh, existing neuropsych tests to operationally define this de dependent variable. And each of these neuropsych tests, they've been evaluated for interpretability, for repeatability. And, and by construction, they measure this construct of clinical import, right? Something that we care about. Um, now that we've measured the dependent variable for both groups, we run a statistical test. Again, here our choices are limited. 
we have an independent variable that's binary, and let's say our, our, our dependent variable is continuous, you can go through a decision tree for what's an appropriate statistical test, and, and, and there's very little um, uh, uh, freedom in terms of which test you choose. There are some that are appropriate for this task and some that are not. And then finally, you report the results of the statistical testing. Um, the effect size and or or the p-value or whatever it makes sense, right? For for the the question of interest. Now let's think about a similar problem for ML-based science. So let's say the starting point is the same here. So for ML-based science, again, we're interested in looking at the difference between these two groups, and we have some inclusion criteria. However, now we want to use speech. We want to determine what are the important parameters in speech that help us classify between these two groups? So we extract certain measures of speech. And here we have lots of degrees of freedom in terms of what we measure. We can choose to measure thousands of different features, whether be they acoustic or linguistic, and we can train a classifier. And again, we have lots of freedom in terms of which classifier we train. And finally, we report the accuracy results. Uh, the, the claim here is that these ingre increased degrees of freedom for the scientists means that they have to make a decision somehow. You have to decide which features you're going to select, and you have to decide how you're going to train a classifier. And um, th this is sort of a, a, an a area that's getting some, some increased um, interest as of late, but the, the, uh, the, the claim is that, that this this, this increased degrees of freedom causes data leakage and, and results in, in, in um, irreproducible results, mostly because the, the uh, idea is that the, the researchers will make decisions that maximize accuracy because this is what's eventually reported. So this increased degrees of freedom and repeated data reuse leads to, to overfitting. Um, and I want to, to, to clarify one thing here. When I say overfitting, I don't necessarily mean that they're using the training data and they're testing on the same training data. I mean, repeated use of the same training data for perhaps, uh, you, you know, you try 20 different candidate models, each one with different features, but only the one that has the highest accuracy is reported. Um, th th that's the sort of overfitting I'm, I'm referring to. The, uh, the amount of overfitting scales inversely with data size. Clinical data sets are in general smaller and positively correlated with data dimensionality. Speech is extremely high dimensional. And so as a result, you have this sort of perfect storm of small data sets, increased data dimension, and, and this repeated use of data uh, leading to over-optimistic results. Okay. Um, can I do a time check, Natalia? What time is it? I uh, I can't see my screen. I'm sorry. Uh, you have time. Okay. Don't worry. Okay, great. It's it's okay. eight fifteen. Okay, great. So so just to take a specific example in schizophrenia, let's say there's a particular theoretical construct that we want to uh, measure using speech. So we'll say semantic coherence. Um, now, of course. There's lots of different ways we can operationalize this, right? You can you have the freedom of choosing um, a, the, the particular elicitation task, so a, a picture report or a dream report or maybe a structured interview. You have some design decision whether to use these BERT embeddings, for example, to to embed um, uh, each phrase or each sentence within some some uh, higher dimensional space or you can use these universal sentence embeddings or, or LSA, and then you, you, you want to somehow convert that into a feature so you can choose to, to do a histogram and perhaps use the 90th percentile or the 70th percentile, or, or, or there's lots of choices to be made here. And so the question is, which measurement do we select? And again, the, the claim here is that oftentimes ML, ML design decisions are, are, are often based on what improves model accuracy which then results in over-optimistic estimates of accuracy. Um, and, and so, so the, 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 the hypothesis is that the, the reason we see this inverse trend is because uh, this, this, uh, this sort of data reuse is happening or these design decisions uh, are, are made 
through repeated data reuse and and smaller sample sizes are more susceptible to the to, to uh, overfitting and, and over optimistic estimates of accuracy. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, the, the whole presentation was kind of a bummer until now, <laughs> like is, everything was, was uh, what's wrong. So, so hopefully we can talk a little bit about, well, how can we fix this? Is there a way forward that um, can, can uh, uh, help us, help us uh, um, uh, develop these speech-based tools that, that generalize, you know, forget cross-linguistically, even within a particular language? Um, Oh, I see. Mark has raised his hand. Well, I'll, I'll make this really quick, but I just wanted to note that that what was actually done in the engineering literature in things like speech recognition and machine translation since the middle 1980s was something that you haven't mentioned, namely distinguishing a training set from a development test set versus a withheld evaluation test set, which was used just once. And then every then a whole new data set was collected and everything was done over again. Yeah, this because, because everyone recognized that otherwise you're just hill climbing on the test set. Yeah, so so this is um, uh, uh, this is true. Although it's it's actually uh, I'm I'm not sure if if this is common practice even in automatic speech recognition. I think data is commonly reused even in the test set in in asr the difference it started, is, that started that, to be true recently but i can tell you from 1985 yeah. to about 2010 never 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 was that done in any of the darpa programs so the the it, now with the increased data size it's no longer required to to sort of limit the amount of data uh, uh the, the number of times that you can reuse a data set however I would, what I would it's consistent with exactly what you just said is that I think that where we are in clinical speech analytics is more like where ASR was in the 80s than where ASR is now. Uh, meaning, uh, well, perhaps so, except that in the 80s they did it right, and that's why yeah. ASR now works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's uh, I'm totally not disagreeing. I very much agree. The cost of acquiring a new test set for these clinical applications, especially within say a single application like schizophrenia, uh, the, where you have multiple different machine learning models that can be developed. Uh, one for assessing social skills, one for assessing uh, 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 say speech as a pre-monitory indicator of, of psychosis is, uh, it is very, very high, perhaps even prohibitively high because especially for collecting the labels right i mean it, i don't have to tell you you've worked with with clinical populations getting uh participants and having a held out test set that's used you, you know once and only once given the number of models that are built is 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 i'm not sure how how feasible that is in the clinical space the one uh area that i haven't talked about that is actually mentioned in the paper in the curse of dimensionality paper that's quite interesting is this idea of differential privacy for uh, allowing you to, to reuse the test data multiple times. And, and the idea there is that uh, uh, you, you perturb the labels in the test set so that you're not quite sure which ones you got wrong. You just get a, an estimate, an overall estimate of accuracy, uh, and, and meaning that you're not able to sort of build in tweaks into your model so that you account for the edge cases that the model didn't get last time, and and that's that's quite a quite an interesting idea, and with 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 some uh, theoretical backing that I think has a lot of applicability here. But yeah, the the, the DARPA style approach where you collect new test data every time, I'm I'm not sure if that scales in clinical applications. Yeah, so uh, that's a great great comment. Um, the, my, my suggestion, I guess, for, for trying to, to overcome some of these limitations is rather than focusing on a specific clinical application and jumping straight into machine learning models, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to focus on the features themselves and to come up with some sort of unified measurement model. Actually, you know, I, I wrote here towards a new measurement model. I don't think it has to be new. I think uh, it just has to be unified and, and operationally defined. Um, and and this this means that uh, and before ever going to, to any 
clinical population, I think we should understand typical variation in the general population. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the way that people produce speech. So understanding variation in the general population is very, very important. And this would have to be done probably by, by uh, language and so on. Um, while this doesn't uh, exist currently, this sort of unified, well, uh, well calibrated set of features, you can think of some, some desiderata, some things that would be very, uh, uh, very useful, some properties that would be very useful for, for this particular measurement model to have. The first is low dimensional and highly repeatable. Meaning that there's, uh, you know, working with thousands of different features, most of which may not be clinically um, uh, relevant uh, or repeatable, really challenges interpretability and cha challenges generalizability. So I think these low dimensional and high re highly repeatable feature uh, properties are, are very important when working with clinical applications in particular. Um, oftentimes, the sorts of uh, uh, clinical features of interest uh, uh, surface when participants are asked to perform these maximum performance tasks. Uh, these are often, so for example, if you're interested in, in someone with very early stages of, of ALS, you can have them produce a task that is motorically challenging. Or if you're inter interested in early stages of, 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 um, of dementia, uh, tasks that are cognitively taxing. And then finally, interpretable and individually validated. There's this new framework that was proposed for validation of digital health tools, this V3 framework, where the idea is that they provide sort of a high level framework for how we think about validation of digital tools. The first is verification of hardware and recording conditions. The second is analytical validation of the features themselves. And, and by definition, if, if you want to analytically validate a speech feature, it has to be interpretable because you have to validate relative to some uh, uh, other uh, accepted way of measuring the same feature. And then finally, clinical validation. So validating the feature on predicting a clinical parameter. Um, so and we, I think there's, uh, I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit about this the some new work that we've recently put together that at least takes a small step in this direction and it's really it, it was motivated by an existing paper there's a, a paper on on a review paper on on depression and suicide risk assessment uh, using speech analysis this was from several years ago and then, and we very much liked how they had organized the 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 findings. They had organized them according to the, the well-known Lavelle model uh, of speech production that effectively breaks speech down into three stages, the conceptualization stage, the formulation stage, and the articulation stage. And in this paper, uh, it's, it's on SCI archive now, it's under review, uh, we defined a series of, of composite features that uh, loosely map on this framework I say loosely because it's actually quite difficult to, to map to the, the, the boxes themselves as there's lots of feedback and, and, and um, it, it's, it's unclear exactly how to define these uh, from, from the sorts of speech solicitation tasks and analyses that we have available. But broadly speaking, we go from, uh, from volition all the way through articulation uh, and, and uh, using and, and define a series of low-level features for each of these composite feature domains. And, and uh, at the end, we're left with a, a smaller number of features that, that um, uh, where, where the goal here, the next step is to individually validate these according to this V3 framework. Although we, we didn't do that in this particular paper because we didn't have the available data. Um, the data themselves, this was a set of, uh, uh, this was 200 samples used from, for, let's see, there's a chat. Yeah. So um, there's a total of 200 subjects in the training data. They're clinical subjects and 10 controls. And for each subject, 
we have uh, several batteries, one that measures neurocognition, uh, a depression index, uh, the, the PANS, the SLOF, uh, the, the SSPA, which is an assessment of social skills, and, and the speech sample from the SSPA. Now, importantly, we have an out of sample test set, uh, exactly the way that Mark described it. This particular test sample, the developer of the machine learning model never had access to this data. In fact, we uh, uh, specifically hid it from them and only used this out of sample test set once when we validated the model that was developed. Okay. So, in order to, to develop models, we've developed a series of models. Um, the first step was to extract the features per patient. As you can see here, you have a, a, a sample healthy control along the different feature domains that I mentioned earlier, a patient with bipolar uh, disorder and a patient with schizophrenia along these dimensions. And we use these features to then predict the SSPA, the SLOF, measure of neurocognition and the PANS plus and PANS minus. I want to call out one thing here. The, um, as you can see, the features that require the acoustic signal, in particular, the ones related to respiration, vocal quality, and articulation, uh, were, were not included in this analysis because we didn't have access to the uh, acoustic samples for, for uh, PHI reasons. So what I'm showing here is uh, the prediction of the SSPA. And again, I, I've combined across the three groups. So the, the, the bipolar group, the schizophrenia group, and the healthy control group. You have the Pearson correlation coefficient and the mean absolute error. This is on the held out test set. Um, and and uh, along the x-axis, you have the true SSPA score. This is a score of one to five. Um, Perhaps I should I should explain what this is. The 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 um, for for those that may have not may not have uh, may not be familiar with it, the SSPA is a, a measure of social skills. It's effectively a, a role playing game. You ask the participant uh, uh, to engage in a conversation with a clinician. Or one of the conversations is uh, related to an, an introduction. The second is making plans about what they'd like to do this weekend, and then the third is uh, uh, one that's by design meant to be a bit com combative. The clinician is a, a landlord and the participant is, is uh, someone that's uh, asking the clinician to, to fix a, a leak in the apartment. Um, and and the, the clinician is hesitant to do so. So as you can see, the, there's nice uh, uh, overlap here between the, the predicted scores and, and the, the actual uh, true scores from the SSPA. Um, similarly, you can develop a model for the SLOF and, and performance declines in terms of percent, in terms of the Pearson correlation coefficient. However, it's, um, there's still some, some positive relationship between the two. Um, there's, I'll, I'll skip over the important feature domains. We can talk about them during uh, uh, discussion if there's interest, but yeah. And then similarly, this is the neurocognitive composite, the PANS positive and the PANS uh, negative. And, and you see the uh, some, some overlap or some ability for these uh, language feature, these composite features to, to predict the uh, uh, neurocognitive PANS plus and PANS minus scores. Um, I say that this is a step in the in 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 the direction, but it's by no means complete. I think the the uh, next step here, uh, and 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 perhaps what should have been done before, uh, even predicting the clinical features, is individual uh, validation of the the language feature domains according to the the um, uh, repeatability and, and interpretability uh, 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 framework that I described earlier. So, so I think this is this is sort of the the next step here. Um, however, I'll, I'll I'll end with this. I think um, it's very important to go beyond model accuracy on a particular task of interest for these clinical applications. I think the more that we can collectively focus on 
uh, developing tools for reliably measuring these clinically relevant constructs from speech, and then building on top of these. Building on top of these would then require fewer samples, smaller corpora, and, and we can get it at out of sample validation more reasonably rather than requiring uh, the, the scale of data that, that speech recognition models now require, which is, uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of hours of, 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 of speech. Um, and, and then, uh, like the, the, the group here is doing, to work to develop and share these, these large-scale uh, speech corpora. So let, let, me, let me pause there and see if there's any questions or, or comments. I see uh, Lena has his hand raised. Yep. Just a quick question, a clarification, uh, Vizar, um, yeah. before we go to discussion. The different domains you showed um, in the speech competency work, how orthogonal are they? Um, I'm trying yeah. to think of volition, for example, may depend on things like word count or sentence length, for example, and that may also overlap on complexity in other dimensions. Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. So I, they're not orthogonal. I think there's quite a bit of overlap with them because, I mean, uh, the simple one is, is let's say, uh, uh, volition and, and lexical diversity, right? Uh, the, the, the two that, that, um, that you mentioned, um, you can't have a, a high lexical diversity with a small uh, uh, number of words spoken, for example, right? So I think there's quite a bit of overlap between them. And, and this is what I meant earlier when I said that they're uh, loosely based on the framework, because it's th these are uh, features that by definition depend on each other. I mean, just based on the, 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 the arrows in this particular graph, right? And so I'm not sure that we can completely disassociate the effect of one from the other, but I think we can uh, 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 have a, a discussion, by, by discussion I mean the, the, the larger academic community, about what the right way to do this is, right? Like what, what's what's a, a good way to do this? And, and so this was kind of one, one step in that direction. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Alberto? Yeah, I'm sorry, I probably missed that part. Did you say that you use a different speech test, right? I use a different speech test, a different from what? Uh, in in the, this measurement model, so I mean, if it includes different condition in which the speaker is uh, supposed to. Yeah. So in this particular application, it was the same speech task. Okay. I think, if, yeah, if if uh, the right way to do this and the way that we've done this in, for example, uh, so, so we've developed a model for mild cognitive impairment that's actually uh, mm -hmm. that's that's in use now. And in that particular case, we try our best to disassociate between some of these uh, these domains. Uh, I think a, a good one is if you look at, say, articulation. If you were interested in measuring precision of articulation, let's say a precision of different phonemes, it makes more sense to have a task that is is cognitively less taxing, like let's say reading, for example, depending on the clinical population cognitively less taxing. So in that particular case, with, with uh, if you measure articulation on a, a red speech task, but measure um, coherence or other parameters on say a picture description, uh, then you, you know that would probably make more sense. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, Visa and Alberto, do you have any comments uh, for each other uh, or to, to foster the discussion? We can also open for an open discussion for everyone. Whatever the, the, the format is, I, I'm uh, happy to participate. If, uh, if, if you think it would be beneficial to, uh, to seed the discussion with some commentary, uh, I'm happy to, to, to do that, yeah. Yeah, um, it, so, so perhaps maybe uh, a, a good, good sort of place to start here is just in general, this, uh, what was common or across the two different, the two different presentations was, was this idea of generalizability. Right. Mm -hmm. When you develop a model, you develop it for the purpose, hopefully, of deploying it and um, and and uh, 
using it in clinic or perhaps to learn something, you know, in ML based science. I, I think there's perhaps a question is how, how do we disincentivize uh, researchers to jump directly to accuracy as, <laughs> as, as the end all be all? I, I uh, uh, and and to encourage the the, the use of, of the more traditional scientific method to to evaluate some of these tools, um, and and so, so I'll throw that out as a as a potential starting point as far as the question goes. Okay, do you wanna to add and comment, Alberto? Yeah, I certainly uh, agree with Vizor. I I find out a lot of uh, surprising convergences between our. Uh, works and research and, and yes I think that the incentives that the uh, research fields and the literature are posing are really trying to drive uh, the research in the wrong direction because the incentives um, the single study the single researcher with limited resources to publish and to publish this that the focus is on accuracy, but I think that um, another important point that uh, my work, most of the work of Bizar um, suggests is that we really need collective uh, uh, work as a research field to overcome this problem, because my impression is this is only the top of the iceberg uh, in the sense that uh, to reach a, a clinical application, there are really a bunch of problems that need to be fixed and, and um, for example, the problem of uh, the impact of demographic is a really important problem. My impression is that, for example, uh, when working on my data is that when we have unbalanced samples, sometimes these demographic differences are really what are driving the mm, classifier more than uh, clinical features. So, and often these are under documented in the paper or not tested at all. So this is a, the problem of bias is uh, another big problem. And again, these need to be tackled by a collective effort because we could make some. I could make some work uh, with my group. Uh, with, uh, so Ricardo Fusaroli is now my president. These are could do some, but this is not enough because we need really. If you think about the schizophrenia spectrum, we need really larger data set. We need really also comparing procedure from different laboratories and as far as so. So point my point is that we need really to move the incentives towards collective work, to, towards collaboration and towards to, to, to really devise a framework that in which collective work, uh, comparative work is uh, on the first point of the agenda, yeah. Great, thank you, Alberto. Mark? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. <clears throat> I'll try to make this quick. <laughs> Two comments. Uh, First, um, I really like Visar's uh, proposal for a way to go forward. Um, I think it's very important, but I would like to point out that actually it's not just a return to science. It's actually a return to uh, um, engineering in this area as it was 20 or 30 years ago. And exactly what you're proposing is what is now sneered at by engineers as quote unquote feature engineering. That is trying to find things to measure that are relevant to the task you're trying to perform, as opposed to end-to-end -end systems where you just throw in the signal and throw in the conclusion and get millions of data points and um, put it all through a highly you know complicated deep learning system and get an answer. Um, so yay, I, I'm all for it. Um, not that I'm opposed to you know testing and accuracy and so on. I would al also though like to measure to mention. I think the importance of the fact that in addition to the genuine confidence and uh, confidence and privacy and um, confidentiality and privacy and so forth issues involved with clinical data, there's also an enormous uh, um, cultural issue, which groups like this one are starting to get past. Um, but frankly, I can tell you that in 1980, 1990, the idea that um, among people doing parsing, doing machine translation, doing speech recognition, that they ought to share data, my God, it was, you know, it's my data. Why should I let anybody else have my data? And, it, and, and DARPA said, share your data or no money. And so they, you know, bit their lip and shared their data. 
And uh, if uh, NIH would do something similar, there would be an enormous rate of progress in the biomedical area. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, Lena? Thank you, uh, Natalia. I just wanted to first thank both of you, Visar and uh, um, uh, Alberto. This is, a, this is a very illuminating session. Um, I'm, I'm slightly sad that it's on a Friday afternoon for some of us because I would have liked to see a lot more interaction here, uh, but I really enjoyed it for one specific reason. I think you both are rising um, what I see as uh, issues, growth pains, a field like this will see uh, when it starts getting interested in a particular topic. Um, you know, you raised the question, uh, with Sarah, whether we should de disintense incentivize uh, the focus on accuracy. But I would also see the other side of the coin. Uh, if high levels of accuracy wasn't reported for some of the predictions uh, that has been made with speech in, in psychosis, a lot of us would not have got interested in, in this area. Uh, so I think, you know, it brought some people together. Of course, there are problems, but I see this as growth pains, and it's as great that uh, we all are together to, to discuss this. Secondly, uh, you know, one of the, the way that you proposed how we solve the problem, uh, that's a very optimistic uh, note, and I and really like um, applying theory to um, really reduce the dimensionality and move forward in terms of how we approach the, uh, the space, variable space. But I think one specific problem, which... Uh, I don't have an answer for, but I think we should all think uh, as a group, and I would like to know your thoughts on, is the issue that you answered when I asked the question about overlap and, uh, you know, orthogonality. Now, we have theories that we can apply to assemble data in a way that helps us to feed into machine learning programs. But operationalizing some of those constructs that the theories give is not a trivial task. It's becoming really uh, an important uh, issue because of not, not just overlap. Overlap is one thing, but you can operationalize the same construct in, in many different ways, depending on which field you come from. Take semantic coherence, for example. There's like 100 different ways of thinking about semantic coherence, as I understand it. So what what is the right way, uh, right direction that we should take as initial step? I don't think there's a right or wrong, but what are the priorities uh, in, 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 in terms of operationalizing some of these concepts? I think this is a very... Uh, interesting question for me. And any any thoughts you have on that, both of you, that will really help us uh, move forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I I can I can share a few thoughts and then uh, happy to then start the discussion. So I don't think we should necessarily start from scratch, right? I mean, th there's uh, one small step forward could be taking existing, say, neuropsych tests that have speech components and simply measuring things or, or, or aspects of the task that have been left on the table uh, through previous uh, through the way that they were previously coded, right? Um, like let's say some uh, uh, a, a recall task, right? If if, if the the, um, the 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 way that the task is coded now is simply the number of words that are correct, well, something that could be done and could be uh, operationalized, I won't say easily, but not with, without a, a ton of effort, is measures of latency in between the words and, and functions in of, of that latency, right? So that's a far, uh, there's a sort of a, a large uh, jump to go from that to analyzing continuous speech, uh, but but it's, it's a step forward. Um, I think it's appealing to want to go directly to the final step, which is, you know, take any speech as input and analyze it through lots of different ways. But I think with the limited data that we have available right now, I'm just, I, I, I don't see a way around running into the same sets of problems, meaning you're going to have, like, you won't know if what you've built actually generalizes. So uh, that's perhaps one approach. Um, another is, is um, and I'm not exactly sure how something like this would be done, but if we can identify some, some ways of effectively using the same tools as the community, right, to where if I publish a paper and I say semantic coherence uh, uh, is, is, is lower in this particular group, and, and then someone else publishes a paper and, and has the same finding, if we're using the same code base, then you, you know that's some form of replication. Um, and uh, right now, with everyone using their own definitions to measure these different constructs, it becomes difficult to, to actually 
move forward. Um, uh, so those are some high level thoughts. And, and I wish I had like a, a very specific answer to your question. And that's helpful. Is there any, any further thoughts on that, uh, Alberto, perhaps? No, I, 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 I totally agree. This is what we try to do on a really small scale with our data. So just trying to, for example, on coherence patterns, we try to replicate all the measures that were have been used in previous studies to operationalize coherence, and then we try to replicate them across the different corpora. Um, so I, I totally agree that at, at least uh, mm, more transparency on the when when people are documenting uh, and also sharing the data and the code that they use. If not the data, at least the code that they use in the analysis, this would be uh, a big step forward at least the starting point, I mean. Thanks a lot, Roberto. Angelica? Uh. And, uh, Hi, yeah. hi, just a moment. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, and also I have a, a comment and a question. Uh, maybe start, uh, let me start with a question for Bizar. What kind of, of um, uh, machine learning uh, model do you propose in your, uh, uh in your study yeah it's a, it's a linear model so uh by design we used a simple model with a, a relatively small number of features the ones that i described there yeah uh, according to uh, this comment uh, the features i understand that you are moving a step forward that uh analyzing uh the speech com communication in a broader uh, approach that, for example, uh, Alberto Parola uh, present presented today, because uh, in this case, even though it's a cross-linguistic approach, uh, the features are only related to speech. In your case, it's related to a, a mm -hmm. broader, speech communication because you have a, a theoretical um, com, a theoretical approach about what kind uh, what is speech about for example with the comments paper so in in your opinion do you think that is more important for generalizability to get this uh broader approach in speech communication that smaller uh, part of uh, speech approach analysis, for example, pitch uh, 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 or another uh, acoustic features? Yeah, so I, I guess a, a few things. The first is, I, I think we were trying to develop a, 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 a set of features that will be generally applicable across different types of clinical tasks. W whether we actually did that or not, I think is to be determined, right? I, th I think that the individual features themselves require additional validation. Um, the, 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 uh, I, I will say not specifically in this work, but in, in other works where we've had the ability to collect different types of tasks, tasks related to to, that, that are cognitively taxing tasks that are, that are motorically taxing sustained phonations. Um, we've, uh, in general, been able to use the same representation, meaning the same features that were motivated by by this this Lavelt model, um, to solve a variety of problems. Meaning, like for example, in in ALS, to detect early signs of ALS, mm -hmm. but then also to evaluate intelligibility. In other words, what percent of the words that a speaker says can another speaker understand? So the hope is that if we focus on a representation for speech, on a measurement model for speech, then um, you know we can all together build on top of the, 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 the model um, 
specific clinical models. Yes, uh, I agree. I agree with you in this case. Thank you. Um, Anyone else has a question? Can I add something to this discussion again? Uh, sure, <laughs> sure. This is, you know, one point for me is, um, I think the generalizability problem that both of you touch upon, Alberto and Vissar, uh, it, it is a problem not just for machine learning. This is, uh, this is a problem for most clinical research that we do. But I also wonder uh, how much should be the pursuit of generalizability uh, a mo motto for uh, utility of, of course, there are limitations and there's nothing that is that cannot be that can be called a universal feature of any tool that we use. So universality could be a myth. Uh, generalizability could have limits. Um, and we sh should we think of different paths of validation? Uh, for example, a, a Germanic language-based model, for example, should be only validated should can only be validated in another Germanic model. Um, I, I'm I'm trying to you know take the example that you had, Alberto, uh, understanding the limits, mm -hmm. and then trying to set ourselves for a path of success by pursuing the right paths of validation rather than uh, approaching generalizability as a holy grail. Any thoughts on any comments would be uh, very helpful. Yeah, I, I, I think that first, the first step would be uh, having larger data set to test the generalizability on, on a larger set of languages, maybe with some like a priori hypothesis. Um, because substantially we don't know uh, how well we can generalize. So my expectation is that obviously if we switch from uh, Danish to Chinese, the generalized bit could be really not so high. So I, I expect that we could have, but there are some solutions, for example, transfer learning, there are multi-language models. The point is to explicitly tackle this problem. So without assuming that we have a universal voice on vocal factor in schizophrenia as was assumed before in most of publications. So the idea was to just find this uh, characteristic pattern, vocal pattern of schizophrenia without considering the potential differences. So I think that mm, this is a specific aim of the research to find. There are some methods in the literature, but Thing that should be fine-tuned on the specific population. We need research on that. that that's my that's my that's my point. Yeah. Pizza? Yeah. What I what I'd say is that I think I think it's a perfectly acceptable solution if you know that the tool that you've built works for this part of the population and may not for the, another part, provided that then you know this is guidance that is shared with users of that tool right so you have some context of use and if you say that it's been validated on individuals between the age of 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 you know 25 and 48 and and uh you, you know that have no um uh uh, uh accent or w whatever the inclusion criteria are um i i think that's a step forward right i mean if, if you're uh, if you know when something doesn't work that's also very helpful because you can then share it so that it's not used with those particular populations. Of course, ideally, you want something that generalizes across as many groups as possible. But it, uh, um, I, I think, humbly, where we are right now, uh, the, the 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 steps forward pr probably are, are are even smaller, right? In order to to develop tools that work work mm -hmm. well. And and if I may, uh, I think that maybe there is an issue on the cultural uh, differences that may impact the experience to have psychosis in different contexts. So uh, maybe different cultures uh, doesn't uh, put much of their social cognition in language as other cultures or other contexts. So to see for gestures, here in Brazil, we use a lot of gestures I I believe that in Italy as well, isn't it, Alberto? So if we were uh, seeing only the gestures, we would expect those differences to call attention more in those uh, cultures that uses more gestures for that. So maybe some aspects of languages are, are 
more uh, easily to address in different cultural contexts or different languages. So uh, th there is a challenge here, I think, to understand what are, and, and that's, that's what I, I like it so much to hear Alberto and Pisa all the time. And I, I knew that you guys together would be awesome. So, uh, but, but it's the, this issue because I know that you do not neglect that this is a complex issue here. So we have to address culture, language, and to then to try to reach out some common basis for the clinical phenomenology that we expect to see on psychosis. So, you know, if I can add to that, because this is actually it just brought to mind something very, what I think is very interesting. You know, if um, there are ways in which we can actually use the properties of the language to our benefit when developing these tools. So one that comes to mind, we have a study where we work with patients with Parkinson's disease. And one of the things that happens with, with Parkinson uh, and Parkinsonism is that the um, there are disruptions uh, in timing. So when you have a stress-timed language like English, for example, where you have uh, long syllables and short syllables, um, all of those have, have effectively go to approximately the same duration. So you, you, you get speech that sounds very distinct. It sounds like it's faster, but what's happening is that the strong syllables are getting shorter um, and, and, and everything's, the, you, you lose the stress pattern. Um, well, that's a, you, you know, the reason that you can pick up on that is because English is a stress time language. In other languages like Spanish, where the differences between strong and weak syllables are not as strong, then the, the you, you know, that feature is more difficult to measure in speech mm -hmm. um, or, or changes in, in, uh, in, in uh, pitch, for example, those are much more directly tied to intelligibility in tonal languages like Mandarin than they would be in in uh, languages that aren't tonal. So I, I actually think this interplay between you know how do we use the properties of the language to develop language specific uh, like tools that that, um, that 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 are more sensitive. That's a really interesting area. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for one last question. Maybe just a comment going back to the first question Mark uh, Mark raised. Uh, you know, who are you speaking to is an important issue mm -hmm. with these you know contextual uh, uh, differences. And I guess you know the issue of um, constraining a naturalistic data collection experiment is is a big challenge. I mean, how much constraints can you put so uh, without losing the naturalism in in data collection? But I would say one thing that we should all strive to do, if possible, is really uh, document the context as much as we can. Uh, mm -hmm. So that some of these things that you said, uh, language specific um, models can be can, can be built uh, when we think of languages, same way we may be able to build models that are specific for who is speaking to who. You know, if you're speaking to a clinician, there may be a specific model uh, that may be helpful in a clinical context where the question answer, uh, you know, question, questioning mode is going on rather than a spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Uh, speech mode is going on. But without uh, carefully documenting the context, I don't think we will have the tools in the future to uh, you know, use it. Uh, so this is an important point for, for our own protocol, discourse protocol, I guess. Yeah. Great, guys. So uh, it was really nice. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Visa, for all this wonderful talks. Thank you, all of, all of you that attended. Uh, the recordings will be on our website as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you everyone for for joining on a Friday. This was great, and <laughs> yeah, it was bye very bye. nice. Yeah. I was I was a bit scared by the time, but at the end, it's been, it's been <laughs> a wonderful a wonderful thank way to you, spend uh, <laughs> from it's Europe. A wonderful way, yeah, to spend an evening night. <laughs> nice. <laughs> The best option of a Friday night evening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. See you, everyone. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye bye.